Chapter 8. How Renard's tail was stroked by the teeth of Surly, out from Rufus's mastiff. Now began the combat between Renard and Tinker. The old Trouvères and the epic poets have sung long canticles about it, as they did about David and Goliath, but Tinker was not alone. Renard the fox escaped from Constant de Noir's net, from Tibbet, and from Lanfert's trap, from Pincher and his beak, descending from Heron to Crow, from Crow to Redbeak, and from Partridge to Tommy Tinker, yet the little sparrow's guile almost put an end to his adventures. But those whose nature is lively and vigorous seem only to fall lower in order to climb higher again. Renard the fox was of that sort. Tinker fluttered round him, still making little circles with his wings, still cheeping his mocking song among the chattering and warbling of his big feathered brothers. Large and small, for they were almost all there, the buzzard from the woods, the lapwing from the moorland, and the curlews from the river, the crested wren with his delicate feet, and the bold tits who were even smaller than Tinker. The birds surrounded him with garlands and festoons, a whole ballet of speckled wings accompanied by the most strident music, but little Tinker's voice was so piercing that Renard lost not a word of the obard he was singing to him. And the crazy fox took neither his eyes nor ears from him, replying to his teasing with frightful menaces, and responding to his backward flutterings with furious leaps forward, his paw raised, his jaws ready, gradually dribbling, losing his breath, seeing red through his sweat-clouded eyes. And yet they were leaving the moorland behind and crossing a plain, going across the hedges and the gates, approaching the metalled road and following it in full sunshine, Renard forgetting his deepest distrust and his usual prudence, and as the farmers and their wives left their houses, they saw all these wings hovering and fluttering along. "'What is that banner over there?' they said, with its shimmering bronze colour. "'Heaven is sending us some great sign, but by our Lord, what does it portend?' And they went out across the plain, the women leading, so great was their curiosity. They went to the river bank, near the bridge with the stone arch which carried the road over. Everything went that way from the village to the forest, and from the abbey to the village church. Everard the pastor was there, his wife Julia, as ugly as all pastors' wives, Bromwen and the little girl Agnes, Foucher the carter, Gondwin the porter and their wives, Tiger the crusher, Corbett, Callus the anvil, their wives too, Lanfert and his pretty daisy, and Stinkerpie who made the flies fall down dead, while dragging on behind came Constant Denoir the rich, his carters, his farmhands and even old chicken Martha. Renard was possessed. He had seen nothing, for he was blind and deaf. But the spell was broken sharply when he reached the bridge. He had never crossed it before. He usually passed downstream from it, below a pool where the river widened and stepping stones led the way across a ford. Above the water, the hollow vault resounded with deep, solemn echoes. This strange sound really brought him back to earth and into his own living body. And immediately, at first glance, he saw everything the birds and the men, the ridiculous tinker beating his wings in the dust and playing about in order to lead him on, the blazing sun, the hilarious expressions and the glowing red noses, the bellies shaking with laughter, it was all absurd and sinister, for the danger was upon him. And it transpired that in this extremity the fox immediately abandoned all his vanity and all his anger, and when he stopped thinking that he was Renard the fox he became Renard again, and at the same time, through sheer instinct, he again found his sure way and his salvation. Like an arrow, he streaked away directly towards the wood in a straightforward, magnificent dash. Bravo, Renard! shouted Lanfert. He admired him, and indeed this russet-hued arrow made a fine sight as it streaked over the plain, over the green meadow and through the flowery undergrowth, leaping straight over the hedge instead of going beneath it, he had no more guile, no more useless pretense, and the wind of speed blew cold as it whistled round his ears. Renard thought that he was already safe. He was still racing. He had heard what Lanfert said. He could hear. His senses of hearing and smell were also wonderfully restored to him. He could hear the sighing and rustling in the air as the wings returned, pursuing him and trying again to daze and frighten him. Go back, Tinker. Go back, Redbeak. These debts will be settled later. Go back, Tursilin of the Raven Hue. At the moment, nothing else counted beyond returning more speedily to the forest. The forest. My forest. Malpass. 
He had drawn in his tail before he saw clearly the approach of a new danger, but this time a thunderbolt fell on him, just when he believed that he was already so far away. Alas, one cannot so easily escape from a plot woven with such care. What happened next was almost instantaneous. Barely had Lanford uttered his warm-hearted cry than another man's voice echoed it, as shrill as it was powerful, making everyone's hair stand on end like the sound of the quarryman's saw. After the fox! It's Renard, it's he! Renard recognised this voice well. Quick, Surly! After him, dog! Outram Rufus uttered a wicked laugh and urged his mongrel forward and galloping feet were already drumming on Renard's heels, spurring him on to a desperate effort. It's he, the fox with the black tail, thief, unfastener of traps, bite his tail, dog, tear him to pieces. Renard flew on, his heart in his mouth, his life was at stake, he knew that if Surly got his teeth into him he would show him no mercy. Already in the wind of their chase he had twice felt his breath scorch the soles of his feet, he rushed forward with great jerks of his head and shoulders. The mastiff made no sound. He was putting all his strength into the chase, into running down his quarry without mercy. After him, quick dog! Faster, Renard! First Outram, then Lanfert. But all the men and women on the bridge were shouting and gesticulating as they followed the furious chase. Has he got him? No. The fox has flown along. Now he's got him. Not yet. And they ran on, forming a long procession over the plain, leaping and shouting beneath the festoon of birds whirling in the cool sky from the pink roofs to the forest. Suddenly Outram Rufus was exultant, shouting at the top of his voice, Well done! Hold him tight, good dog! As he crossed a hedge, Renard visibly wavered, and Surly caught hold of him. He caught him by the tail, on a level with the black tuft. Renard rushed under the thorns. The dog could not stop in the midst of his leap and followed him, clenching his teeth, far enough to catch his nose on the long black thorns. They were like teeth too, sinking into the mongrel's muzzle. They went deeper and lacerated him horribly. Renard pulled, and Surly growled. One pulled, and the other held tight. More pulling. Which would let go? The dog's teeth, or Renard's tail, or the thorns? It was the tail, which was coarse at the very tip, its skin torn, and minus a tuft of black hairs. But safe. Pain spurred Renard on. He outdistanced the dog, who was caught up far away in the thorny undergrowth. He recognised the moor, the ditch, and his passageways. He reached the stronghold, flattened himself beneath the brambles, plunged down, and finally collapsed panting beside Ermelin in the warm darkness and the divine silence. <laughs>